If you have your Bibles, turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 5. 2 Kings chapter 5. We're going to talk tonight about follow the instructions. Follow the instructions. And I have uh, five points tonight, but they're quick points. All right, number one, the problem. Number two, the solution. You know there's a solution to every problem in life. There's a solution. The attitude. Attitude is everything. The obedience and the purpose. All right, the problem, the solution, the attitude, the obedience, and the purpose. When we talk about following instructions, I remember when Jonathan was a toddler and we had the bright idea one Christmas to get him a swing set. And so uh, Lori said, can you do this? And I said, yeah, I think I can. So I go out in the backyard and start this deal. And about 45 minutes later, I had all the stuff laid out and was trying to do it. And I said, honey, I got to have some help. All right. I, you know, I, I just could not figure it out. And so she read the instructions and then told me what, you know, look for this certain thing. And we put it together pretty quick. But I'm telling you, I'd have been out there eight hours doing it by myself. All right. And I think some of you ladies would agree with me. Men have a hard time or a challenge by following the instructions sometimes. Ladies, is that? <laughs> All right. But in your spiritual life, it is absolutely necessary to follow the instructions. And what are the instructions? Well, if you have a Bible, you're holding them in your hand. These are God's instructions uh, to us. So let's look at 2 Kings chapter 5, following the instructions. The problem, now Naaman, commander of the army of the uh, king of Syria, and again, Syria was uh, Israel's enemy, and uh, he, he, he was a good man, look what it says, was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master. So if you just looked at him per se, he'd have to be honest, he'd have to be a hard worker, because when I think of the word great, that, that's, a, that's a big deal there when it's talking about moral character and who you are. Because by him, the Lord had given him victory to Syria, he was also a mighty man of valor, okay? Which, again, just, you know, uh, as far as a commander, uh, as far as, you know, there was no fear in him, okay? He did his job and he did it well. And when you see the word but, there's going to be a change. It described everything in him, but was a leper, okay? And we all know that uh, leprosy uh, was very common in Old Testament biblical times. Uh, we know that they had colonies and they had towns to where uh, lepers would go and they would stay in that isolated place. They were not in the regular public. And even if they decided to go in town, uh, there would be people that would walk by and see them and they'd holler, leper, leper, unclean, unclean. So when you think of his life, he had everything going for him, but he had this disease which limited what he could do. And it, you just have to understand uh, that, you know, looking in those days, you were frowned upon, okay, if you had leprosy. And even some, uh, you know, uh, folks thought that, you know, th they had been cursed by God. Okay, that was another thought. So if you had leprosy, uh, it was a serious problem in your life. So we see the problem, okay? And then it says, in verse 2, here's the solution. And the Syrians had gone, back, gone out on raids and brought back captive a young girl from the land of Israel. So you can even see that battle that had been going on between these two. And uh, when they would conquer uh, parts of Israel, they would bring back uh, uh, young ladies and they would turn into slaves. 
Okay, they, they were slaves. She waited on Naaman's wife. And again, uh, Naaman was a commander. Naaman was a general, uh, you, know, uh, you know, on base. Uh, they had the best quarters. Uh, they had servants. They had all kinds of things because of who he was. And then she said to her mistress, if only my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria, for he would heal him of his leprosy. And Naaman went in and told his master, saying, Thus and thus said the girl who is from the land of Israel. Then the king of Syria, and by the way, his name was uh, Ben Had Hadad the second, uh, the king of Syria. Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. And the king of Israel was Joram. Uh, so we see this problem. He had leprosy. And, and, you know, this young lady, and, and you think about that. You, you talk about the divine providence of God, you know, to put her in Naaman's life, in the slave to the wife, knowing what she knew. And folks, God orchestrates everything in your life. I mean, uh, Tony, if it was a different slave, that may not have happened. But God knows what he's doing uh, when he is going to perform a miracle and when he's going to do these things, folks, I, I, I believe still with all my heart, there is nothing God can't do. God can do anything. So you see this. It's not a coincidence, folks. God orchestrated that. And then it says in verse 5, And the king of Syria said, Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he departed and took with him ten talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 changes of clothing. And that was fairly normal in that day. Okay, you, you came bearing gifts when you uh, went to uh, a different town or even an enemy. And those gifts were a sign that I, we're not coming for war here. Okay, I, I, you know, we need to talk to the king and, and we need to ask the king for a favor. Then he brought in the letter to the king of Israel that said, now be advised when this letter comes to you that I have sent, na sent Naaman, my servant, to you that you may heal him of his leprosy. And it happened when the king of Israel read the letter that he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and make alive that this man sends a man uh, to me to heal him of his leprosy? Therefore, please consider and see how he's uh, seeks a quarrel, quarrel with me. So the king of Israel did not react the way, uh, you know, Nahum thought he should act. He talked, he, he acted like it was a thing of aggression. Because even in those days, it was the prophets that did the healing. It wasn't the king. Okay, so he was, he was thinking, there is a trap here. Something's not adding up. And tearing, the, tearing your clothes is a sign not just of mourning, but, but of, of distress, of, you know, uh, this, this is not good. Why are you doing this? So even the king of Israel was, you know, on edge and wondering, you know, are they trying to do something? Verse 8, so it was when Elisha, the man of God, heard the king of Israel had torn his clothes, that he sent to the king saying, why have you torn your clothes? Please let him come to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. And you remember who Elijah was? Uh, Elijah is probably the most well-known of the prophets in the Old Testament. And after Elijah was passing from the scene, uh, really Elijah, I, I, I just got this uh, out of a book I have, uh, was a disciple of and a successor to the great prophet Elijah. Elisha was plowing when Elijah threw his mantle on the youth, adopting him as a son and calling him as a prophet. After about six years, Elijah was translated and Elisha became the chief prophet in the northern kingdom of Israel. Elisha continued in his ministry for 55 years. So you can see how God's hand was on Elijah, but he, 
he transferred that. Elijah transferred that to Elisha. And, and he had uh, some of the same gifts and, and spirit uh, that Elijah had had. And uh, he was a patriot with a concern for justice and morality in his nation. And again, he helped overthrow uh, the house of Omri. So Elijah comes on the scene. Elijah goes there. So he was now at this time uh, the prophet in Israel. Verse, n- verse number nine. We see the problem, the solution, go see Elisha and the attitude. Then Naaman went with his horses and his chariot, and he stood at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you, and you shall be clean. So he gave him instructions. He told him what he needed to to do okay and and folks sometimes uh in life uh, you know we get instructions and maybe they might be out of the norm or not you know just you know things that you would logically think should happen and i think that's what was happening here okay in the first place if you read this text slowly you'll realize that naaman had a a plan in his head of how this was going to play out And folks, we do that sometimes in our own Christian lives. We tell God what God's will is for God's, what what God's will is for our lives. We sometimes get out ahead of God or we have a plan. And then when it goes awry, we want to know why didn't this plan, you know, work? Well, folks, we have to go to God first, first and foremost. God has a plan for everyone's life. And so, Naaman, being a general, having all these gifts, expected Elisha to come out and, and, you know, do his thing and heal him. All right? Now look at verse 11. But Naaman became furious and went away and said, Indeed, I said to myself, I will, uh, he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. Now here's a Gentile. Here's a guy that's not saved. Here's a very indication that he did not know the Lord. And he's telling basically the prophet how to heal him. And folks, that, you know, we, we can't do things on our own. And God is not illogical in any sense. But some of the things he does... You know, they don't make sense as far as the world sees things, okay? The world, you know, sees, sees Christianity and sometimes, and, you know, they'll call us fanatics, or they'll just, you know, they'll, they'll just say all kinds of things when they just really don't understand who we are. And here, I think, was the case with Naaman, because he wasn't from Israel, because he didn't come up under, you know, the Word of God and the, in being around the prophets of God. He had in his mind how this thing was going to play out. And I'm just telling you, it was, it was, that was not what God had in mind uh, for Naaman. And then he said in verse 12, Are not Abana and Parfar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? In the water at Damascus in the Jordan River, uh, it was not clean water, all right? It, it, it was kind of a muddy water. And basically what Naaman was saying, he just said, man, we got cleaner water than that. And think of how he was thinking. He was thinking logical, okay? And again, God's not illogical, all right? But he, he gave a specific, the, the prophet gave a specific thing for him to do, and he was balking at it. He was just saying, man, we got cleaner water than you. Why, don't you t- why can't I go to uh, the water here, all right, and go dip down in it? It's clean, it's better, and then I'll be healed. And then it says, could I not wash in them and be clean? And let me answer that for you. No, you can't do that. Folks, we have to do what God tells us to do. Even sometimes our own family, our own friends, and our own people say, you know, 
I think you're making a mistake. Twice, I changed places in my ministry. When I left Cameron Baptist Church, after being there for the first 36 years of my life, okay, and after being a youth minister there as a volunteer for three years and on staff for 14 years, when I decided that God was going to move me to First Baptist Church of Alma, I cannot tell you how many people in my going away fellowship said, you're missing God. You're not supposed to leave here. And how do you think that makes you feel? It, make, it makes you even question what, you know, what you're doing. And, but all along, I knew this was what God wanted me to do. When I left First Baptist Alma after 10 years, going away fellowship, the chairman of deacons walked up to me and said, you're, miss, you're missing God. Your ministry here isn't finished. So these guys were trying to tell me what God's will was for my life, okay? And again, folks, I was super focused. I knew, you know, because even again, in the world's eyes, at Cameron Baptist, we were running 1,100 people, and we had six full-time staff members. We had baptized 365 people in a year's time. And you look at that, and, and you think, it, it doesn't get any better than that. That's the J. Harold Smith days, Paul. We had J. Harold Smith one spring, and we had Bailey Smith in the fall. And we seen God move in a miraculous way. And even when I came over here, I mean, there were people, we, we were running about 500 at First Baptist Church of Alma. And if we had 75 here when we started, that was a good day. So logically, looking at it from the world's view, you are going this way, and the world tells you you start, and you just get bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay, and that's what I'm saying, folks. You, got, you, you have to listen to God. You have to know what God wants you to do. You, won't, you don't let people around you talk you into something that is not of God. And so Naaman, just thinking and had this in his head, this is the way it's supposed to go, and it, that, that is not the way God said. God told the prophet what needed to be done, and that was the way he was going to find his healing. But you talk about stubborn, okay? So look at the rest of this. So he turned and went away in a rage, okay? We're not talking angry. We're talking probably swearing, probably mad, probably think somebody seen what he was doing, just saying, what's wrong with that dude, okay? And what was Naaman's problem? It's the age-old problem of pride. Okay? He's a general. He's used to giving the commands. He has an idea of the way it ought to be. And the man of God said, no, you do it this way. And he rejected that idea. And folks, I believe with all my heart, when we are not in tune with God, when we don't read the instructions, we're going to miss God. And I, I can tell you from experience, the best place to be in your life is in the center of God's will. Right where God puts you. Right where God puts you. Because really, folks, you know, even here, I, you know, I never, ever, it wasn't even on my radar to build a sanctuary this time. Matter of fact, after the first year, I was thinking, Claire, you was with us. And we had, to, George had to listen to me whine, wondering, you know, what's going on here, all right? You know, it wasn't going so good the first year, all right? But God had a plan, and I had to wait on God's plan. Sometimes there, there are things that happen that you, you, you can't understand, but if you are focused on God, if you are in the center of God's will, God's going to get you through. He will, I promise you. So we see him upset. So he had an attitude. And really, I jotted down this. I thought of this this morning as I was going over that. Uh, Naaman had to be humbled before he could be healed. Okay? You know, the sin of pride, God, God hates the sin of pride, folks. Okay? We, we have to humble ourselves before God. And, and that's what Naaman was needing to do. So we see the problem, the solution, the attitude, 
and now the obedience. And his servant came near him and spoke to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? And folks, that, that's what was in his mind. He was thinking, man, you know, he's going to lay hands on me. There's going to be maybe some flashes of lightning or something going, and some, some fantastic thing is going to happen. Okay? He had that plan in his mind, and that's what his servant was saying. How much more then when he says to you, wash and be clean? And what he's really saying is, how hard is this? All you have to do to go to the Jordan River, get in the river, dip seven times, and it's going to work. Okay? That was the instructions. That was the plan. So we went down and dipped seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Naaman finally followed the instructions. Finally followed them. And, you know, it, it, when I think of this, the flesh of a little child, don't you like to smell babies? Ladies, I know you like to do that. Babies have a certain smell about them. You know, when they're really little, and I know some of it, you know, the, you know, the grandmas put the powder on them and all this stuff, but babies just smell good. So he didn't, in my opinion, didn't just heal him, he made him even younger than he was. He was better, certainly, than a leper, but the Bible, and folks, God doesn't do things part way. All right, when God does something, I mean he does it for a reason and for a purpose. So we see the obedience. He finally uh, did what God had told him to do and followed the instruction, and he was healed completely of leprosy. Now look at the purpose. Here's the key, folks. Here's the key. And he returned to the man of God, he and all his aides, and came and stood before him, and he said, Indeed, now I know that there is uh, no God in all the earth except in Israel. Notice the wording. If he was a Gentile, then he served pagan gods, and it would have been a little cheap. Okay? But it says... He is stating, and again, this is not our normal profession of faith like we do, but it was a, a life-changing moment in the life of Naaman. Even through all that, not following the instructions, not doing what the prophet said, his whole goal, God's goal for this was for Naaman to be saved. But see, here's the deal about healing. You can be healed, but nobody lives on this earth forever. You're going to die sometime if the Lord tarries. So which is the most important healing? Is it physical healing or is it spiritual healing? God had a plan for Naaman, and God's plan for Naaman was that he would find Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior in by faith. And, and folks, this is a faith statement. If you read, I, I dwelt on this longer than this particular part. I, indeed, I know that there is no God in all the earth except Israel. Now, therefore, please take a gift from your servant. And again, the man of God did not take the gift. Okay? And why? Because there could have been that attitude of, if you've got enough money, you can be healed. Okay, because I, I jotted down what I read earlier. The gift was 750 pounds of silver, 150 pounds of gold, and many costly garments. All right, so when we look at from the monetary aspect, that was a wow gift. Okay, and, and I'm just telling you, uh, folks, uh, you know, you cannot buy salvation. He was a general. He was well paid. He was well respected. He was an honest man. He was a hard worker. But that didn't mean he was a Christian or, or he was a believer. So God used this situation so that Naaman could come to Christ. And you think of the, that also 
Think of the influence he would have back in Syria. We're talking about a general. We're talking about a, a man that has many men under him. Who does that remind you of? Joseph was not, not exactly what Joseph did. He went through all this pain, went to jail. He did no wrong, went to jail, but yet he, I love that part in Genesis 50. He said, y'all meant it for bad, but God meant it for good. And he saved not only his family, but he saved a nation by, you know, storing the grain. And even the king, I mean, he said uh, uh, to Joseph, there is no other God like Joseph's God. And folks, that's why, you know, God, you know, again, he, he works in his ways and he works in his time. That's the other issue we have. When we don't see God work right away, we think, well, maybe that wasn't it. Maybe I missed God's will. But I'm telling you, I believe, again, of the nine fruits of the Spirit, patience is the one that really tries, you know, us. You know, God, God just saying, you know, you can have this, but not right now. Look at verse 16. But he said, as the Lord lives, for for whom I stand, I will receive, this is Elijah, Elisha, nothing, and he urged him to take it, but he refused. So Naaman said, then if not, please let your servant be given two mules, mule loads of earth, for your servant will no longer offer either burnt offerings or sacrifice to other gods, but unto the Lord. And there's another sign of salvation to him. And it says, yet in this thing, may the Lord pardon your servant when my master goes to the temple of Ramon to worship there, and he leans on my hand and bow down in the temple of Ramon. Ramon. Uh, when I bow down in the temple of Ramon, may the Lord please pardon your servant in this thing. And some people say, well, you know, uh, even one of the commentaries says he thought he compromised there. But again, I don't think he was, I think what he was doing was he was uh, taking this soil you know, part of the land of Israel, and he was he was using it as almost an example uh, to the king. Okay, you know, the God of Israel is the one in control. The God of Israel is the one who made this soil, and so I think what he was doing was getting to where you know, if he didn't obey his orders, then he'd been in trouble. Okay, and I and I do not think he worshipped. He followed the king in there, but he did not worship a foreign god, is what I believe happened. Okay? And then it says, so he said to him, go in peace. So he departed from in a short distance. And remember the servant of Elijah, if you read right down through there, he'd heard about everything that had happened there. And he decided to chase, you know, down uh, a Naaman and try to get some of that profit some of that that gold and that stuff from him and he bold-faced lied to Naaman you remember what happened the leprosy that Naaman had went on that servant because he lied okay just bold-faced lied two scriptures I want you to see as we close first Samuel first Samuel first Samuel chapter 15 first Samuel and again this you know, I don't have time for the background, but literally Saul was rejected as king because God told him to go and destroy the Ammonites. And he did not do that. He did not kill the king. Uh, you know, and basically right before here, he blames it on the kid or on his, on his people. He said, those, those ones under me, they're the ones that didn't do it. He was trying to play the blame game when he did not follow God and God took the kingdom away from Saul. So verse 22 says, so Samuel said, the prophet of God, has the Lord great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as in obeying the voice of the Lord. So what is he saying? What does it say in the New Testament? If you have aught with a brother, leave your gift on the altar. You go get right with that brother. Then you can come back and give a gift and it will be acknowledged. Folks, that, that's, that's talking about being right with your fellow man. And that's why I say, folks, I know... 
and I, I hope you don't get tired of it because uh, it was a lesson I learned a long time ago. I need to be right with God. I need to be right with my family, and I need to be right with my fellow man. Okay? And it says, behold, here's the one, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of rams. Folks, when you hear the instructions of God, just do it. Just do it. Okay? Don't let pride get in your way. Then Isaiah 55 Isaiah 55, verse 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, no, your ways, my ways, says the Lord. See, we don't, we're not always straight in our thinking. And folks, there are many times in life when I'm praying for God's will for my life, I literally pray to have the mind of Christ. Folks, he thought right. He did right. He was always in tune with his Father. God's ways, God's thoughts are not always our thoughts. We need to get to thinking like he would think. Verse 9, for as, as the heavens are higher than the earth, uh, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts your thoughts. See, Naaman was simply thinking about, I, I need to be healed of this leprosy. I don't want to have this. And most of the time, folks, it, it, it just kept spreading. It's a disease that, you know, keeps spreading. It's not like you get it in one place. Okay? So he was thinking of the physical aspect, aspect of what was going on, and God was thinking of the spiritual aspect. Okay? To be saved. To have a life-changing moment. To be built to be able to influence a pagan king and to be able to influence a pagan nation is much higher call than what sometimes we settle for. So don't, don't, uh, you know, you know, don't, don't take the world's view. You know, don't follow the world because I got news for you folks. The world's going to pass away. It's all going to be burned up one day. And what we do for Christ, all right, and, and, and being in the center of God's will is so important in your personal life. Father, thank you for the day. And God, thank you for the reminder that we need to follow the instructions. And God, I believe that God has specific instructions for every person. And God, what might be right for me or the direction that I need to go may not be right for someone else. So God, I pray that, uh, Lord, we, we, we can get advice and we can listen to people around us, but God, we have to do it with discernment. God, I pray that we would be in so in tune with you that when you gave us the instructions, we would say, I hear and I obey. God, I just pray that everyone in this building and everyone listening to us online would listen to the voice of God. And God, I pray that we would follow the instructions with our heart, soul, mind, and body. God, you've put us here for a reason. You put us here for a purpose. And God, I pray that every one of us can find that purpose in our lives and fulfill that purpose in our lives. God, we need everyone. This is the body of Christ. And God, I thank you that your Holy Spirit is here, and I thank you that your Holy Spirit is talking to us. So God, thank you that you are the God of salvation, and thank you for uh, saving us. And God, we, we, were, we were sick in sin, and God, you healed us from that. So God, thank you for all that you do for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.